Well, welcome back to Finance Uncut. On today's episode, housing market bubble to burst. So I did this video in the middle of 2021 called Property Market Warning. Uh, I did it in a two-part video series. I'll put part one uh, in the description below. I'll put a link in the description below if you haven't watched it. I recommend watching it. Some of the data might be slightly out of date and whatever, but the thesis is still the same. And uh, before we get to this video, guys, uh, if you do like this video, we would really appreciate it if you gave us thumbs up and hit that like button. Uh, it really does help the algorithms and whatnot. So anyway, with that, let's get stuck into the video. And coming in from the Australian, the coming jump in Australian interest rates could be brutal. This article goes on and says that financial markets expect the RBA to raise the official cash rate around the middle of this year in 2022. And within two years, the financial markets are expecting seven rate rises. Uh, to be around 1.8%. And further out to 2025, so three years, uh, they expect it to be 2.5%. So that means that we're going to see mortgage rates somewhere between 5 and 6%. And that could be brutal because a lot of people locked in and got mortgages in the last 12 months at 1.9%, 1 1.99%, uh, low twos. So we're talking about quite a big rise in in rates and in australia we we have one to five year fixed rates there's a couple of banks that offer seven and ten year fixed rates but we don't have 30 30 year fixed rates like the us do um and 80 percent of loans in australia are variable only 20 percent are fixed new zealand it's the other way around it's about 80 percent that are fixed 20 percent variable uh, so australia we're definitely um uh, we're going to, to feel the impacts of rising mortgage rates, uh, that's for sure. And over the next two to three years, a lot of these people that locked in two and three year fixed rates at 1.89, 1.99%, they're going to be coming off to much, much higher rates, possibly, as I said, between five and 6%. Now, the article also mentions uh, a quote or from Shane Oliver, uh, who's the chief economist at AMP Capital Markets, that household debt to income ratio today is about three to four times that of the late 1980s when we had higher interest rates. Um, so he, what he argues is a 0.25% rate increase in the official cash rate that is, uh, today is the equivalent of a 1% rate rise back in the 80s. Now here's a tweet from Stephen Kukalis and I've mentioned him in multiple videos before. Uh, he is a Keynesian economist. He's a former advisor to uh, Labor governments. And he's been a forever property bull. Basically, the last 20 years, he's been a property bull. Even when uh, the markets in different sectors did go down, so Perth and, and Darwin, uh, Sydney and Melbourne, when they have gone down over the last, well, from 2014, we'll have a look at that in a sec, he's been saying, no, 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 it's going to go up, property, property bull. He's now turned bearish. Uh, interest rates are too low and will rise because so many mortgage holders are so far ahead in their repayments. The RBA will have to hike more than it otherwise would to get the effect of dampening demand and with that inflation pressure. So he's actually one that thinks that the RBA are going to raise rates a lot more than what the market uh, is talking about. So he wrote this article, interest rates are too low and will rise, which is right here. And we won't go through it because... I really got so much information in this video that I need to share with you. So can't have a look at every article. But what I will do is I'll put a link in the description below. I recommend you guys have a read of it. So in this tweet, Tony Lacantro, who is a stockbroker, uh, had a bet with Stephen Kukalis on the property market. <clears throat> and um, he said, let me pay out the lost bet first, but 25% median price decline either in Sydney, Melbourne over... Three years, odds of nine to two, Stephen. I have to stand by my convictions. However, <clears throat> Mr. Kukalis replied, mate, I have to say I'm more in your camp from here. Supply and demand dynamics are a big negative, as is the interest rate outlook. Though in a lift, through in a lift in 
publicly built and funded housing over the next five years, we could easily see minus 15%. So they had a bet that the housing market would, or Tony had a bet with him that the housing market would fall, I think around 25%. And Stephen Kukala said, no, it's going to go up. And well, what, what have we seen over the last couple of years? In fact, prior to that, I can't remember when their bet started, but it, I think it started a few years ago. But uh, Tony was looking all right there in the early stages. Um, but then, yeah, that happened. However, as I said, now Stephen Kukalis, he's talking about a 15% fall. Tony, 25% fall. Uh, so this coming from a property bull. So even when the property market did fall, when everyone was coming out saying, hey, guys, it looks like it's peaked, he's like, no, 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 it's going to keep going. So for him to say that the property market's going to fall, it's going to fall 15%, that's huge. So here, uh, Dr. Murray, Dr. Cameron Murray, uh, just refuted this article in the Sydney Morning Herald he said, our bigger cities are not seeing record rents. The rent, rental price action we're seeing is mostly about people taking their high incomes to regional areas to outbid for the best home. So yeah, we've seen a big move out of the city. And so we've seen the demand uh, rising there. So let's just have a quick look at some of these charts. So this is weekly rents in Melbourne. And well, you can see from the beginning of the Cervasa sickness, uh, rents are down. Although they're slightly rising now, uh, they're not as high as what they were pre-cough. And here's weekly rents in Sydney. Uh, one, yeah, they are rising, but once again, they're not back to their previous Cervasa uh, uh, sickness highs and definitely not back to their 2017-18 highs. And here from my buddy Tarek, since the 7th of January last year, US 30-year fixed mortgage rate has risen by 1.05% from 2.65% to 3.7%. Rates are now higher than where they were prior to the cough. US housing market will be one to watch going forward. And same thing here in Australia. So our uh, three, four, five year fixed rates, as I said, you could get uh, those rates at under 2%. Now it's over 3%. So from CNBC, mortgage rates jump again, causing headaches for home buyers. So you can see from this chart, uh, yeah, 3.45. Uh, however, um, as Tarek said, it's now 3.7. And again, from my buddy Tarek, uh, since the pandemic began, the Fed has been buying $40 billion a month in mortgage-backed securities to artificially suppress rates. They now own 25% of all outstanding mortgages. But now rates face the potential double whammy of QE ending and rising yields. Now, he's linked a Mises article there. Uh, and the article is, is entitled, The Federal Reserve Keeps Buying Mortgages. Now, once again, we don't have time to go through this article in this video, but I'll put a link in the description. Once again, I highly recommend you guys read it. Uh, some wonderful information uh, for, for those of you who are homeowners and investors in the property market uh, from some very smart people. Obviously, the Austrian School of Economics is the school that uh, I align with, and uh, this comes from the Mises uh, website. Now, once again, from my buddy Tarek again, uh, recently the total value of US residential US property hit $38.3 trillion. This is 166% of GDP. Total value of Australia's residential property is $9.4 trillion. This is 470% of GDP. So Aussie property is worth 2.8 times as much as US property relative to GDP. Now, coming in from News Talk ZB, or ZB, uh, ANZ predicts painful rise in interest rates. So this is New Zealand. So New Zealand's largest bank is predicting interest rates will have to rise much further than as previously forecast as central banks face an uphill battle to contain inflation, similar to uh, Stephen Kukalos. On Wednesday, ANZ said it now predicted that the benchmark official cash rate will rise to a peak of 3% over the next 15 months. That's just over a year away, up from the current 0.75%. Previously, ANZ had forecast that the official cash rate would peak at 2% in the current, current cycle. So there you have it. We've got uh, New Zealand rates rising. Uh, 
Australian rates rising, US rates rising, UK, Canada, you name it. And also in New Zealand, house prices and volumes fall, chief concerned about law change. So this is uh, the regulator tightening lending rules. And now there is a lot of concerns about house price volumes and uh, house, well, house prices falling. And there's talk of uh, APRA, our regulator here in Australia, also tightening uh, lending on the banks. And one of the things that we're hearing is that debt to income ratios. So they're looking at uh, putting in debt to income ratios of six times uh, and, and maybe even lower. I think, I believe the UK, and correct me if I'm wrong, someone fact check me and let me know in the comments below. I think the UK have a debt to income of four or four and a half times, um, I think. So this is going to uh, have a big impact on property price growth uh, and, and property prices in general. And so if they do that, what does that mean for households? Well, the median household could only afford a $630,000 home, and that's with a 20% deposit. Uh, to afford a $1 million home in Australia, if this is if the that's the debt to income ratio does be enforced by APRA of six six times debt to income, then to afford a one million dollar property, you're going to need 158 percent of median household uh, income to 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 do that. So yeah, it, it's very interesting times to see what happens not just with interest rates but also with uh, you know regulators. Prudential regulators uh, regulating uh, banks, uh, bank credit. And here, interest rate hike could come as soon as March, says Fed's Brainard. And coming in from Reuters, Fed's Mester would back March rate hike to fight inflation. And the article goes on to say how she has seen how inflation hurts the poor and middle class. So... This is the Cleveland Fed president. Also from Reuters, Fed's Bostick says three hikes, fast balance sheet runoff needed for inflation fight. And this is the Georgia Fed president. And he argues for three rate hikes as well as quantitative tightening. So he's talking about balance sheet runoff, uh, quantitative tightening. So this could get very interesting. And Fed President, or the Philadelphia Fed President, Patrick Harker, also now sees three or four rate increases in 2022. So the markets, uh, they're pricing in rate hikes. I think it's nearly 100% for three rate hikes. And uh, 4%, it's getting up to 90%. Uh, the markets are predicting four rate hikes. And here in this thread from Jim Bianco, he says, uh, why was last week so epic? I believe the whole bond market finally realized that easy money is over. Quantitative tightening is coming. For weeks, many bond players argued this table was wrong. The Fed would go less than four hikes. No quantitative tightening. Not after last week's FOMC minutes. And here you can see the target rate probabilities for March. And... Uh, well, 64.1% chance of 25 to 50 uh, basis point rate hike right there. And the latest chart, I've shared this before, 81.6% chance of four Fed rate hikes in 2022. And yes, we are seeing yields rise from short-term yields all the way out to the 30-year and coming in here from Forex Live, the forecast for an imminent Bank of Canada rate hike getting more numerous. And what's interesting, at the start of 2021, the Bank of Canada said no rate hikes until 2023. In June last year, the Fed's dot plot projected no rate hikes until 2023. Now, the Bank of Canada is expected to raise rates imminently with the Fed tip to follow in March. Meanwhile, in Australia, the RBA said, no, nah, we're not doing nothing till 2024. And here's Stephen Kukalis with his two-minute take, uh, which he does on Twitter. Uh, he says the RBA risks stuffing it up again. A interest rate hike is needed in February, 
with more hikes to follow. RBA needs to stop pretending inflation and wages don't lift for a couple of years. My two-minute take, the labour market inflation and interest rate pressures. Once again, this is huge from Stephen Kakalas because uh, he has been the opposite uh, for as long as I've known him. Uh, so he's calling for a, a interest rate hike in February with more to follow. So he's... He's thinking that the RBA are going to lift rates a lot further than than what the market thinks. And if you needed any sign that we are at a market top, good old Jim Cramer, we must not panic. Remember what he said about Bear Stearns? What was it, a day or two before they collapsed? Uh, I've shared in other videos his um, stock picks (laughs) and how... How red they are! How how much uh, they they've fallen when he told people to buy. I mean, uh, there's another one I'll save for a gold video um, that Jimbo says. And uh, yeah, anyway, I, I always say do the opposite of what Jim says, and you'll do fine. So he says we must not panic. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say go panic, but if this ain't a sign, um, yeah. And in the Australian Financial Review, housing crash, when it comes, will last for years. Now, uh, those of you who have studied uh, housing market crash crashes will know that markets on average crash just under 50%. Uh, and from peak to trough, it's almost six years. So yes, properties don't, the property markets throughout history and around the world don't fall like stock markets. Okay, so in March 2020, we had a 32% fall in the stock market in, what, three weeks? Uh, Very, very quickly. Housing doesn't happen like that. It takes quite a long time. And one of the perfect examples is Ireland. So here you can see a chart of Irish house prices. And when they peaked in 2007, uh, it they went down till 2013. So you can see close to six years from peak to trough for Ireland. Now, remember back then that uh, central banks actually predicted a soft landing for housing. And then we saw housing uh, in Ireland fall over 50% from its peak to trough over that time period.
So here we've got a chart of the S&P Case Shiller US National Home Price Index. And you can see from uh, the bottom there in 2012, uh, US real estate has been doing quite well, uh, going up uh, very consistently. And I've been a big uh, US real estate investor uh, since that time. Um, I got lucky um, and I put it down to luck. Uh, definitely wasn't skill on my part, but I definitely got in at the bottom there and rode that wave up. And well, pretty much since the Cervasa sickness, uh, this chart has almost gone vertical. And so the question is, is it now developing into another bubble? And well, what do I think of that? Well, I've been selling my US real estate into this bubble. In 2021, I've been selling most of my US real estate. I've only got a couple of investment properties left uh, in the US. Uh, I've sold most of them this year. And that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Maybe it's not. Maybe this uh, this is just normal and it can go up continuously at this rate. And here in Australia, uh, Sydney median house price, 1.3 million. And average yearly wages, 69,000. Well, so let's say 70,000. So it's not been wages uh, or wage growth or fundamentals that have driven housing. So what has driven housing? Well, debt. You look at a chart and it's clearly debt. Now, have a look in 2018, 2017-18. Sydney house prices actually fell. They actually fell. So people, you know, don't think, people in Australia think that housing only goes up. We're seeing so much FOMO in the last 18 months. So much FOMO. We are getting so many first home buyers coming to us that they really don't care anymore and they're not looking at the fundamentals. They're not even looking at what will happen if interest rates rise 1% or 2%. They just, they're just, they are so scared. They need to get a house right now. Or they'll never get a house. So that, that's their attitude. That's been their attitude for the last 18 months and that is concerning. And here's that time period. So this is that 17, 18 period, 2018 period, sorry, 2018, 19 period leading up to the federal election. Sydney house prices fell 11% in one year. That's an annual change. And as I've shared so far in this video, housing market crashes or, or, or downturns don't happen very quickly. They take many, many years from peak to trough to fall. So at, you can see there, Melbourne, 10%. So a 10 to 11% fall in one year is quite a big fall. Usually, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, low, middle, single digit. And here is a capital city property prices since September 2005. Obviously, it only goes out to 2020. But you can see Perth uh, in yellow peaked in 2014 and over a six year period declined by just over 20%, just over 20%. So these are s slow, gradual declines. Um, Darwin in that browny, orangey color, I don't know, I'm colorblind, so you guys, I don't know, I think it's browny orange. Uh, Darwin also peaked in uh, 2014 and went down almost 40% over that six year period. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of Australians, uh, and and you know, one of the major arguments made by experts and and people in in my industry here in Australia is that how that a housing bubble cannot exist because mortgages are recourse in Australia uh, rather than non recourse. Uh, so this means that a borrower is liable for the full amount of the mortgage, whereas non recourse means the borrowers have no legal liability to pay back the mortgage if they were to default. Uh, so a lot of Australian commentators and so-called experts compare us to the United States where they say they have non-recourse loans. Uh, this led to the popular term called jingle mail, referring to the notion that uh, defaulted borrowers would just mail back the keys to their lender and walk away from the property. As the argument goes, non-recourse lending in the US was a major factor in the run-up to housing prices. So, you know, all this bad lending because, you know, no one had any risk. Um, Whereas Australia's recourse mortgages and thus, you know, 
doesn't have the irresponsible amounts of mortgage debt. However, there's only one small problem with this view. It's, it's absolute nonsense. It's fake. It's, it's not true. A study by two Federal Reserve economists debunks the notion that the US has non-recourse loans. Out of the 50 states and DC, 11 are non-recourse. All the remaining 39 states are recourse. On top of this, in some of the non-recourse states, the first mortgage may be non-recourse, but all preceding mortgages are recourse. Also, it often uh, depends on the legalities and the judge's decisions as to whether a borrower is required to pay back the full value of the loan in a non-recourse state. Um, worse yet, some of the states that experience the largest uh, housing bubbles have recourse loans. For instance, uh, Florida and Nevada, Nevada, whereas California and Oregon uh, were simil similarly affected uh, and they had uh, non-recourse loans. So overall, there's no real difference between states that had recourse and non-recourse uh, loans, uh, apart from recourse borrowing who tend on average to hold onto their properties longer before defaulting. Now, one thing that they don't compare Australia to is Ireland. And Ireland, as you saw, experienced a colossal run-up in prices uh, during the decade leading into their housing bust. Uh, and, and you know, what people don't, and, and, and one of the reasons they don't want to compare is because Ireland has recourse mortgages governed by really strict rules, even stricter than here in Australia. A non-payment in Ireland may even result in imprisonment. Now, I don't have any evidence that that happened. I don't think it was enforced, but that's what they have. That's, that's their laws. We don't have that. So clearly, recourse mortgages did not prevent a bubble from forming in the housing market in Ireland. Uh, the idea that recourse mortgages enforces responsible and conservative behavior, just it, it cannot hold true. So for mine, uh, moving forward, it is all about interest rates. Uh, keep an eye on the bond market. Keep, a lot, keep an eye on interest rates. This is where it's all at. Um, and obviously, now it is implied that the Fed funds rate is likely to go up 100 basis points this year. And I had to share this chart, long-term interest rates back to 1790, having a look at the interest rate cycle. So feel free to pause the video and just have a really good look at this. Um, I thought it's very interesting. And pretty much have a look at where we are now. So this is a fantastic chart. And look, once again, just pause the video and just read this out. I'm not going to go through it. I don't have time. But uh, this is very, very interesting. Phase one and phase two of long-term interest rates. So why do central banks lower interest rates? Well, they say it's to drive the economy, boost demand, uh, boost investment. Well, this chart right here uh, shows that uh, private business investment, and especially in the non-mining business investment sector, interest rates have no play in it. They don't play a part in, in increasing business investment. And it's done nothing for productivity growth either. Uh, in fact, you, know, you could argue that it actually harms productivity growth. And there was this awesome piece that uh, Joseph Wang, the Fed guy, uh, who headed up uh, the New York Fed, the, the trading desk, where he actually did quantitative easing. So he understands it better than most. Uh, and he, he just shared a post and he said, good post on evidence business investment isn't very sensitive to interest rates. Businesses care much more about expected future demand than the price of money. And that's so true. And that is Austrian economists have been talking about this forever. Uh, Professor Richard Werner, who, uh, you know, he gets it as well. Uh, you know, he talks about this a lot as well. So those of you might know that a uh, study uh, was done, uh, modelled uh, by the RBA, and they actually said that interest rate changes, not supply, is the key for house prices. So the study said uh, that the stunning increases in house prices between 2013 and 17 was indeed attributable to the reduction in mortgage rates. So uh, for the avoidance of doubt, the RBA economists demonstrated that housing supply and population growth had compar comparatively 
little influence. Now, we've had no immigration to Australia. We've had our borders locked. So the whole population growth, we can put that to, to one side. Uh, housing supply, well, apparently, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the ABS, uh, we have over a million vacant properties in Australia right now. Hmm. There you go. So their piece went on. What I do know with certainty is that the RBA's own research finds that a permanent 1% reduction in real mortgage rates will lift house prices by a stunning 28%. And that's what we've seen. We've seen um, interest rates uh, falling and mortgages rising, a lot more debt being taken on. And so it's no wonder we've seen uh, real estate prices uh, do what they've done. And I'll certainly benefit from that. The question now is, has that interest rate cycle uh, changed? Has it turned? Are we about to see rate rises? And if a 1% reduction in mortgage rates lifts house prices by 28%, what's a 1% rise going to do to house prices? What's a 2% rise going to do to house prices? This is the big question. So with interest rates falling, that increases people's borrowing capacity. And then you have expanding loan volumes, which drives prices higher. And you can see in this chart here that, uh, that, that the average loan sizes for owner occupiers in Australia, this is an Australian chart, has increased dramatically, especially uh, since uh, the federal election. Uh, then there's a little wobble during the Cervasa sickness and then pretty much then it's gone vertical. So this chart, uh, the average mortgage in each state is higher than it was prior to the Cervasa sickness and the average mortgage size was 510,000 in New South Wales in 2019. Now it's 770,000. That's a big change in, in three years uh, or under three years. So expanding loan volumes, higher loan to income ratios, more percentage of income dedicated to servicing, and yeah, uh, that creates a problem when interest rates rise. And here in this chart, well, New South Wales house repayments are higher despite lower interest rates. And that is because people have taken on larger and larger mortgages. So even though interest rates have come down, people are actually... Uh, paying higher interest rates because they're taking on bigger debts. So there's higher risk taking by banks and, and individuals um, with that. Uh, problem is, once again, what happens when interest rates rise? And I'll argue it's not even interest rates. It's also inflation. It, people's goods and services, their daily expenses. Taxes, do we see them increase? Mortgage stress. Speaking of mortgage stress, let's actually cut to a clip from Martin North talking about mortgage stress. Now, mortgage stress, the first thing to say is that I'll start with mortgage stress. And um, this is to the end of December or just early January, as I said. So mortgage stress actually went up. So 41.8% of households are now registered in cash flow terms in mortgage stress. So that was up from last month. And you can see that there's been quite an acceleration before, you know, pre-COVID February 2020 at 32.9. It's been wandering higher up and down a bit. Uh, basically, when things open up, things get a bit easier. When things um, grind closed again, things get harder. 41.8%. That's a lot of households. So a couple of things to note on this chart. You can see at the beginning of the millennium in 2000 that mortgage stress was around 12%. But then fast forward to 2017 and we had mortgage stress at 20%. So it rose about 8% uh, in, what, 17 years. But then in, what, three, four years, mortgage stress has doubled since then. At the same point, well, the same time that interest rates have gone to nothing. So, you know, this tells you something. The other thing to consider as well that not a lot of people are talking about is inflation in, uh, you know, and, and then the CPI, so the increase in living costs in goods and services. So as interest rates rise, uh, 
not only do mortgage payments rise, which eats into disposable income, uh, but if we see governments start increasing taxes, that's going to eat into disposable income. Uh, but inflation, the goods and services, the, the, the expenses, the other expenses that we have, that's going to eat into disposable income. And that's why I like um, Martin North's measure of uh, mortgage stress is it's based on cash flow. It's measured on cash flow. So cash flow in versus cash flow out. You can see that households are struggling even with low interest rates. So as the inflation gets worse, as interest rates rise to combat that inflation and possibly seeing higher taxes, this is going to squeeze a lot of families. If you want to then say, well, how things are going to play out, my scenarios, um, my RBA baseline is, I think, in the next two or three years, we might have a rate of 1.5% and we might see house prices go up five or down 15, somewhere in that range, depending on units versus apartments. I give that a 10% weighting. But my best case, this is the one that I think is most likely to happen with the 50% weighting, is that rates probably won't be more than about 1% over the next couple of years. Unemployment rate will be about 48 Mortgage stress will be down a bit from where it is, but not dramatically so. And there is a small chance of an uplift, but a stronger downlift for house prices and 50% um, weighting. But then if you want to say, well, we, if we get more crunches, be it financial crunch or a, a COVID crunch, then there's more downside. So that's sort of the way that my scenario. So let's just pause it there and just a few comments here. So you can see uh, Martin's probability from the last time uh, for this longer term crunch has actually fallen 5%, but his more severe multi-wave disruption uh, has increased 10%. So if you actually add these possibilities or probabilities up, 50, 75%, 85%. So in Martin's opinion, using his models and data, uh, he has an 85% probability that house prices over the next, remember this is 24 to 36 months, so two to three years, House prices from here, from December, have a chance to either go up 10% all the way down to a 45% fall. So that's his 85% chance or probability that that's where properties move over the next two to three years. And uh, Martin certainly had a reputation of being a property bear, but I think that's a little unfair. Uh, he just he just reports whatever the numbers uh, come out at. That's his data. So in this chart, you can see the new loan commitments total housing, and you can see from the Cervasa sickness, it basically goes vertical. You go back, have a look at the chart. It's it goes up and down a little bit, but but slowly rises, but it's gone vertical, and that's not sustainable. Now it started to roll off, but it's November just jumped back up. So in owner-occupied uh, numbers, 7.6% rise month on month. For owner-occupiers, investors uh, jump 3.8%. Um, for owner-occupiers, it's 17.2% year on year. In investors, it's 86.9%. 86.9%. This is the thing. FOMO has kicked in. You've got the first home buyers that jumped in big time. Now, they've drifted off a little bit. Uh, they have stabilized a little bit. Uh, investors have jumped in. Um, yeah, so it's it's not sustainable in my in my uh, eyes. It's there's so much emotion happening right now in the market, and all the tailwinds I think are blowing out, and we're about to enter all the headwinds. So here's the first home buyers. Uh, you can see that they went vertical with all the government uh, stimulus packages and. Um, yeah, offerings that that had to first home buyers, and I've said in other videos that first home buyers uh, could have gone from having no deposit to uh, potentially up to eighty thousand uh, dollar deposit there. Now, just in November, it did slightly tick up, so that that fall has has stopped briefly. Uh, but yeah, it's it's overall it's not looking good for first home buyers. Now, remember, banks do have. A lot of vested interest in property prices continuing to rise because their balance sheet uh, is highly leveraged against residential mortgages compared to just about every other country in the world. 
Now, here's a really interesting chart, and I'm pretty sure I got this from uh, economist Lindsay David. And uh, you can see the red arrows. So red arrows mean uh, interest rate increases. Green arrows mean interest rate decrease. So this is when the RBA uh, either increased or decreased uh, rates. Now you can see just before the global financial crisis, the RBA raised rates. And by the way, the, the lines, so that's the uh, ABS, APM, Residex, and CoreLogic. So all together, that's, you know, they measure house prices. So when the RBA raised rates, uh, we saw housing prices fall. Then they cut. They cut big time uh, during the GFC. Uh, also added, uh, doubled the first home buyer grant for first home buyers, and we saw the spike in that first home buyer chart that we looked at before, back then in 2008-9. And then we saw house prices rise. And then uh, in 2009, uh, the RBA started raising rates, and housing prices started to fall again. Uh, and then at the beginning of 2012, then the RBA just went cut, 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 cut. So in, uh, property prices rise. And, well, we've only had interest rate cuts since then. In fact, Philip Lowe, our current governor of the RBA, even when he was deputy. So as the governor and deputy governor, he's never been there when the Reserve Bank have raised rates. His whole time there uh, as both governor and reserve governor uh, or deputy governor, he's only presided over rate cuts. So if he starts raising rates, it'll be the first time uh, in his tenure to do so. Obviously, that 2018 period leading up to the federal election, uh, we saw house prices fall, and that was without high unemployment, without raising rates, without um, yeah, everything going on. So, yeah, you know, if they could fall 10% in one year, 10, 11% in one year, imagine what they could do with rising interest rates and unemployment and everything else uh, going on, uh, a sick economy. So, yeah, it's going to be very interesting for house prices. So let's wrap this up. What do I think the RBA is going to do? What do I think is going to happen to house prices? Well, I'll finish with this chart. So this is a combined real money leverage accounts, Aussie net shorts, close to extremes. Um, so asset managers, institutional investors, leverage funds, they are short the Aussie dollar. Now, it's surprising to see the Aussie just below 72 US cents. Um, although it does remind me around that uh, 2018 period uh, where both asset managers and leverage funds were short. Um, that seems to be where it is right now. And so from what I'm hearing out of the RBA is they want the Fed to raise rates. They want New Zealand to raise rates. They want Canada. They want the UK. They want to be the last ones to the party in raising rates. And with that, uh, they expect that uh, the Aussie will fall. And that's probably why these asset managers, institutional investors, and leverage funds are shorting the Aussie because they also think the RBA is going to be the last one to the party. Um, and therefore, you know, uh, we'll see uh, investors moving in to chase those higher yields, those higher government bond yields. And, um, and so we could see a lower Aussie dollar. And if we do have a crash and a liquidity event, then we could see what happened in March last year, where it fell down to just under 57 US cents. Now, I've shared in other videos Brent Johnson's dollar milkshake theory. He thinks the Aussie is going below 40. I don't know if it's going that low, but I definitely see it going down to 50 again uh, if everything plays out. And that's why I'm sitting on a portion of my portfolio in US dollars. So, um, however, a lower uh, Aussie dollar uh, will definitely be, uh, you know, maybe attract uh, some international investors back into Australia. I, I don't know, maybe. I mean, Australia has definitely done a lot of uh, reputation damage over the last 18 months or so, and I won't go into that. Um, so whether people want to come here, whether they want to invest, whether they want to bring capital here is a whole other question. So, yeah, I think uh, I think the RBA are going to be the last ones to the party. I do agree with that. 
I think New Zealand, they've shown that they've already raised rates twice. Uh, the UK have raised. Uh, Canada looks like they're going to be the first ones off the rank. Um, the, uh, uh, the Fed, uh, I'd be surprised if they don't raise in March. Uh, definitely three rate right rises you can lock in. Uh, probably four. So that's uh, you know 100 basis points, 1% rise in the US. Uh, Australia, yep, I think maybe about the middle of this year they might squeeze a little rate rise in. Um, maybe another one towards the end of the year. Uh, but by 2023, I think uh, I think the RBI, I think Stephen Kukalis and, and um, some others are right that we're going to have to, in Australia, raise rates quite a lot more than people are expecting. And therefore, mortgage rates are going to go much higher. Um, now, I know the debate is that Central banks can't raise rates because, you know, the debt bubble will collapse and asset prices will collapse and, you know, they'll jump back into quantitative easing and whatnot. And I think they probably will. Uh, but I think I've got my portfolio set up very nicely uh, for both um, both outcomes to, to play out. I think we're sitting right on a nice edge uh, economically and within financial markets and asset prices. And so I think it, you need to be very careful, very, very careful. Anyway, what do you guys think? That's my opinion. Love to see your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. If you like this video, please hit that like button. We really do appreciate it. Take care, guys, and I'll see you all again on another episode of Finance Uncut.